Thank you for joining us for today's stakeholder call to discuss the WEIM resource efficiency evaluation enhancements phase two revised draft tariff language. My name is Isabella Nicosia representing ISO stakeholder affairs and I'll be facilitating the web conference today. I'm also joined on the line by Heather Curley, our senior counsel from legal who will be walking us through the revised draft tariff language today. Um, before we get started, the revised tariff language is available out on the initiative webpage. You can get to that page by going to kaiso.com, and then you'll want to click the Stay Informed tab, go down to Policy Initiatives. That'll take you to our main initiative landing page. And then if you scroll down all the way to the bottom of that page, you'll see the link to this uh, initiative specific page um, and the draft tariff language is available there. The call today is being recorded. The recording is for informational and convenience purposes only. So any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. If you need technical assistance at all during today's meeting, please send a chat to the event producer. Our event producer today is Sharon. And then we all are, are going to be taking questions throughout the call today. So when it is time for questions, we'll give instructions. But if you entered the WebEx and connected to audio through the WebEx, you'll just raise your hand using the raise hand icon located to the right above the chat window. If you connected to audio separately, you'll need to press pound two. Um, and again, we'll, we'll remind you of those instructions when it's time for questions. The agenda today, um, I'm just going to go through where we are currently at in the stakeholder process, and then I'll hand it over to Heather to run through the tariff language. So here we are under the decision phase, actually. Um, this initiative was approved by the board um, December 14th, and now we are going through the revised draft tariff changes um, before filing. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Heather, and she will uh, share the draft tariff language for us. Yes, thanks everyone. I think I'm going to be in the process of getting presenter mode and bringing up um, the, the tariff here. But um, I, I think there's a number of you I haven't met yet. So hello, it's nice to meet you. I am, I'm Heather Curley. I am senior counsel here at KISO. I joined the KISO team um, about five months ago now um, from private practice. I've been in the en energy industry for a number of years, so I have not focused specifically on California matters. Um, my focus has been at the national level. So I'm diving in. Um, I know you guys have been at this for a long time, um, and the team here I think has done a great job, uh, you all included in that, in getting us to this stage. So, so I'm really, you know, he here to here to try to finish this up as we as we walk things through. So we have Danny on the line who will probably um, be crucial in answering a, a number of your questions. Um, but I just want to run through the comments that we received. Um, I'll do a full run through um, once through, and then I think we'll we'll go back and take them item by item and and bring them up for discussion. Um, let me see here. I'm going to increase this size so I think people can see the tariff better. And I apologize as I'm getting up to speed on the KISO logistics. Um, okay, so just first off, we had a couple admin edits from Six Cities. Thank you for those. They were good throughout. Um, we have picked them up everywhere that you offered them. They are indicated here in the yellow highlight um, for everyone else to take a look at. I think they are non-objectionable, though if anyone wants to discuss these, of course we can come back. Um, the point six cities raised is we just need to maintain clarity between the EIM products and the EDAM products. Um, and when we're talking about transfer products, that, that can get um, a little confusing. So we, we've put in some surcharges here rather than charge and, and a couple other admin issues. So again, folks can take a look at those as we go through, but I, I think they are mostly non-objectionable. Um, okay, now moving on to kind of the settlement and billing calculations here. Um, Pacificor asked for some clarifications as to whether this is, is automatic and, and can you supply if, if you are not receiving. Um, the response is on the screen, but, but essentially it is, it's going to be automatic. So, so one, once you have um, completed the market, uh, the master file process rather, um, the, the transfers will occur automatically into the balancing authority. Um, all balancing authorities are supplying the emergency assistance transfer product um, to be compensated as, as we, we lay out here. Um, PG&E on this section requested um, some clarification on the term base transfers and how we're using that in the calculation. 
Um, we recognize that, yes, there could be value in defining base transfers as a capitalized term here and including an in Appendix A. The, the issue is, of course, that the term is used in other places in the tariff, and we don't want this to turn into a larger tariff filing. So um, we, we do think there's value in adding clarity on the term. We, we propose to do that through our BPM process. Um, and as we um, will go through more, we have a couple other things in the BPMs. And so we think that should take care of it. Um, you know, we're happy to discuss that with folks, but th that's the reason we have not gone with defining it in this initiative, though picking up the definition could be something um, we would handle kind of as one of our later cleanup filings as we're, we're farther along and um, could, could do a, a more of an admin um, revisions at FERC. Um, so moving on to the next point again from pg and e thank you for your comments um james and danny i'm gonna i'm gonna pull you in on this one um when we come back to it but again i'm just doing a quick run through here but um uh we were looking for a corollary um for the iso markets and and we settled on the the regulation up um as the appropriate one. And so we'll have Danny and, and to the extent James will possibly um, talk through that um, with the team, but we do think that's the right corollary to settle on. Um, on allocation of revenue from the transfer product, uh, PG&E was just requesting a, a little bit of further clarification on pro rata. And we would propose to do that through the BPMs with an example, because we, we do agree that, that clarity could be valuable there. Um, we just don't think the tariff is is the right place for it. Um, again, just picking up some of Six Cities admin edits here, and um, again, PG and has some some questions and clarifications on on the charge transfer, and we'll get to that through discussion. Um, we have a lot of language here that we don't need to discuss. Um, here we're talking about the, the you know, the, ha the, the LPT exports excluded from the CAISO's RSE. And so both six cities and CPUC have requested clarification to add some specificity. And so we're going to take that back to the team. We're going to try to see if we can add clarity here with just a couple of words. Um, and, and, but, but we, it's a good comment and, and we're going to have that under consideration. And then. Um, on the transfers and the transfer product itself. So uh, before we were discussing settlement and billing for the product, this section discusses the product itself. Um, CPUC raised concerns in their in their comments that we got last night um, with the market notice process. Uh, we can talk through it, but the market notice process is the most equivalent to the master file process, which is why it's chosen. But again, we were envisioning um, Further, sorry, I, I, I'm still like, so Dan, I didn't see your whole comment. Give me a second there, but we are um, considering further revisions in the BPM um, that would that would go into the details that I think the CPC may be concerned about. So, again, we, we can discuss that um, as we come back. And then I think the most challenging section that um, most of this call is going to focus on is really going to be the LPT exports and and how we propose to deal with those. There's there's a number of issues that have been raised here. Um, I think we have um, some, some different points from the stakeholders from Bonneville and the CPUC on the EEA3 language. Um, we, we're gonna come back for a, some clarification on the term protected self schedules in subpart C. And we're going to discuss some issues with the, the GFP tag. And again, I think we're, we're trying to see our way through here recognizing that um, you know we're, we have the board approval and and need to move forward with this or goal is to move forward with this at FERC. So I'm going to circle back up to the top, Danny, so we can just take it from there now that everyone I think has a, a general overview of of where we are. Um, I'm going to figure out how to actually view the chat or Isabella or Danny, if you see them, you can take those questions. But Danny, do you have any other um, thoughts or comments before uh, we get kicked off on the details? Uh, no, let's dive in. Okay, so Isabella, I can't see the chat. Can you tell me what our question was? I know it was about the version we're looking at. Sure. So it's um, is this version with the comments and responses posted, or will it be? Um, it is not yet posted. Correct. It is not yet posted. 
um, I don't know if we have a clear practice on that, John. Do we have a clear practice on whether we're posting this draft? Um, it, it's a bit of a, I, I think since we have flagged a few things for discussion, um, you know, it, it, it's relevance may not be useful as much after this call, but John, do you, what, what do we normally do with these? Or John's audio, John was having some issues with his audio earlier, so I'm not sure if he got it connected. We'll let you know. Um, okay, Pacific Core, I think your issue is up first. Um, so happy to take questions on, on our response to you um, here and, and walk through that. But um, again, I, th I think your, your question was good on, on how is this going to work? It is gonna be an automatic process. Yes, um, everyone will supply. Um, but if you have elected into the product, you you will automatically receive. So, Danny, did you have anything more to weigh in on that? And and, and then I think um, if we have any comments on that, we should take those now. Yeah, it, it, I think you summarized it pretty well, Heather. The idea here is that if you opt in, then the limitation of transfers in the direction of failure is removed and the market will clear assistance energy transfers using the surplus supply that's made available to the EIM. And then the settlement will be after the fact as described in the tariff and policy. Okay, so, and again, I'm not sure how these calls work every time, so I might be running it a bit different. But so if anyone has comments or questions, I think on, on this particular Pacific Core, if you needed more clarification, if anyone needed to weigh in, I think now is the time so that, so that we hear any of your issues. Um, otherwise, I think we're gonna move on to the term base transfers. Okay. Um, again, base transfers, you know, PG&E, we, we hear you on the, on the request there. I, I think it's a, an issue that we're going to take back and it's going to be on our list of things to consider. Um, for now, we would propose just to provide that clarification um, is in the BPM. Um, and then, Danny, did you want to weigh in um, on any difference on the base transfers in the different areas now? Or do we want to say, kind of save those details for when we're drafting them out? I think that we can save those details. I just want to be clear, we're using this as the reference for non-EIM transfers, essentially, is, is what these AET will be calculated on. So however we need to capture that and clarify that, I think we'd look to do that. So okay. this is James. Um, we'll probably, I think we need to add in instead of base transfers, base scheduled transfers. Um, and that represents what was bilateral transactions and does not get into uh, changes in bilateral trans transactions. I hope that so I helps. With that clarification from James, I guess pg &E, you know, that, that might hit right at the point you were raising, <clears throat> but, um, but let us know if you want to discuss it more now. Um, of course, you know, the team is available to you after this as well. Um, but if anything more needs to be said on, I think, base transfers, and I think by adding in the base scheduled transfers to add that specificity, um, but, but, but with any more clarity to be in the BPM. Then moving on, I'm just going to collapse these so we can see the provision on on the same screen. Um, here we're talking about uh, the charge applied to CAISO. And so the um, in for EIM participants, we're going to we're going to do an adjustment for your um, upward available balancing capacity as a credit. And of course, the CAISO doesn't have the equivalent. So where we settled on was um, the regulation up adjusted as, as specified here um, as the credit for CAISO. James or Danny, did you guys wanna weigh in and give any more background or explanation on that? Sure, Heather. That to us seemed like the most equivalent, like you said, to ABC. We didn't want to give a credit for spin or non-spin because that may be used more for contingency purposes uh, the reg we would expect to be used to meet an energy insufficiency or flexibility insufficiency in the CAISO BAA, uh, should that occur. 
And then James, can you specify whether we're referring to reg up energy or reg up capacity? It's going to be capacity. And so um, let's look at how we describe regulation up from the capacity perspective and maybe we'll add the word capacity into um, this portion of the section. It's the final okay. cleared regulation. So pg e just to clarify, you know, just to be, be clear on that, it is going to be the capacity. We'll, we'll take it as we, I think, generate the next version here. Um, we'll see if we need to add in the word. I think we need to go back and just double check the definitions. Um, but is there any, any, I think that one's the easy one, number two. Um, did anyone want to have any further discussion now on the corollary that, that we've settled on here as the equivalent to the EIM upward ABC as a credit? for EIM participants. Again, to enter the queue, you can raise your hand by pressing the raise hand icon located above the chat window. Oh, and I figured out how to see the chat. Okay, excellent. Um, moving on then, um, Again, we're, we're allocating to KISO pro rata. I think there's nothing more to discuss here. We hear your request for clarification and we'll, we'll plan to do that through an example. Thank you again to six cities for the clarifications here in the language. Um, okay, transfer surcharges again. Um, so let's see. PG&E's question is, is essentially, what if it's zero? Um, you know, what, what if there is no, no incremental energy um, net of, of our list here that we have? I, I think, how will KISO allocate that? So, pg if I haven't understood your, your question correctly, definitely let us know. Um, but, but Danny, James, did you guys want to weigh in on that? I, I don't know if we had envisioned that it could be zero. Um, and how we want to address that. And so I think we should discuss it a bit with the stakeholders and um, and get any guidance we need. I don't, in, you know, based upon historical, um, because we're doing portfolio by portfolio or SD portfolio, this should not be zero. Um, and so I've never seen it zero because we've included both instructed and uninstructed in balanced energy by the SC perspective. But we can look if we need to have a two tier, uh, a backstop tier allocation or not. Okay, so it sounds like the chances of it being zero are, are quite low. I think we'll do a double check on that. Um, you know, but I don't think it has come up, um, but, but I think a good point. It, if we're if we're seeing that that we think there's a chance it could be zero, I think we will add in the backstop. Um, PG&E, we can follow up with you on that if it's something you want to weigh in on. But if you had different views of the likelihood of it being zero, um, definitely let us know. We do have a hand in the queue um, from Bonnie Blair. Hi, Bonnie. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Could we go back to the, question, the the section about the credit and the available balancing capacity and what is the the, the corollary? The, yeah, the yep. corollary for the CAISO. So could, could you maybe provide a little more background on how you came up with that? Because maybe I'm I maybe I'm not understanding, but they seem to me, you know, regulation up. It seems like like probably um, more limited than upward available balancing capacity in other BAAs. And so I'm, I guess I'm wondering if, um, I, I guess I, I feel like it would be helpful to understand more why in your minds that's the right parallel or corollary. Um, because I'm concerned that the that it might be too small a credit, I, I guess, to get right down to it. 
Yeah, th thanks for the question, Bonnie. I think, Danny, why don't you start with the lead, but I think pulling others from the CAISO team is necessary. But can you just walk through with the stakeholders kind of our thinking process when we were trying to develop the corollary for the for the EIM ABC? Yeah, I think it, it goes back to what I said earlier, Bonnie, that we would like to try to retain our uh, spinning and non-spinning reserves uh, and not have those be a credit for the assistance energy transfers, because I don't think that we would necessarily look to dispatch those in all cases just to meet a supply insufficiency and avoid an AET transfer. And, and then, James, I think we may have rejected some other ideas, too. Did you want to provide any context? I think Bonnie was concerned that, that this credit is going to be too small in comparison to the to the ABC credit. And I don't know if you had any insight you wanted to offer on that. Um, it should be relatively the same. Um, the, another correlation on why we have regulation um, isolated versus thin on thin is um, a couple of years ago, um, there was an enhancement that we calculate available balancing capacity energy in the same manner that we do regulation energy. And so we've drawn a correlation between the available balancing energy and the regulation energy and kind of propagated that toward the here. Um, when we do the calculation of available balance capacity energy, we do focus on that energy, which has been base scheduled and identified as regulate, reg up and reg down. So we are drawing a very close correlation to what we consider available balancing capacity for calculating rate, uh, available balancing energy as we do for regulation to calculation of regulation energy for, for this purpose as well. Okay, I, I think I followed that and I, I definitely follow, you know, why you don't think spin and non spin reserves are the right, the right source of a credit um but is it is it not the case that um other baas can can include or consider as available balancing capacity any any capacity that they don't um that they don't include in base schedules? In, in other words, don't they include in that terminology sort of all non-scheduled capacity? And wouldn't that be, in many instances at least, a much higher volume than just regulation up capacity for the CAISO? When they base schedule it, um, that, that capacity, they're supposed to be base scheduling it and identifying it as spin, non-spin, reg up, reg down. Um, when I apply the, this is from a settlement perspective, when we apply the calculation of available balancing energy, we've only focused on what they have identified as base schedule for serving regulation up or regulation down. So when it comes to applying this credit, I was going to apply the exact same logic. So if they've identified it as reg up versus reg down energy that has been base scheduled, that is what we would consider available balancing capacity that would apply for this credit for EIM BAA, which is why we'd also do that for the ISO. And so my, my problem may be, I have a misunderstanding of, of what available balancing capacity is. It, are, are you saying that available balancing capacity is I, essentially encompassed within ancillary services identification and divided up between ancillary services? Is well, that 
Well, I'm going to interject here for just a, a quick second. I, so, so I don't want to get bogged down in this issue, but Bonnie, I think it's a good one. Does it make sense for us to have a follow up with you on kind of the ABC and walking through the reg up? Um, just to make sure, because I, I do think James has kind of done the similar thinking on that, and um, and and I think we're we're aligned that it's maybe the right corollary. But I think you know to to give a little more more, can we have that as a follow up to dive a little deeper on this? Oh, that's that's fine. I I just want to be sure I'm hit a comfort level with with talking about you know apples to apples, which. I mean, you, no, you no, guys are obviously convinced that you are, and I respect that. Um, <laughs> I, I, like I said, my problem may be a misunderstanding of what gets included with available balance. So, yeah, I think an offline discussion would be great. Thank you. Thank you. And Isabella, if you could just keep track of that, because I do want to follow up with everyone that we need to, and I don't want anything to get lost. So um, at the end, we can connect, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you keep track of the folks who we're going to follow up with. Um, Okay, so I think where we were, I think we had completed our discussion there. We've we've done pro rata. Um, I I believe we've provided the the answer to to the you know what what if it's zero on the incremental energy um, within Kaiso area. Um, so I believe now we're going to switch topics a little. Um, we're we're going to go down here to again kind of the RSE for Kaiso. Um, we we did see the comments from six cities and CPUC on slightly different issues, but kind of hitting at the same on on some additional clarity here. I need to circle back with the team um, to make sure that they agree that that we need that clarity and exactly you know what additional words we need. I think it's just a couple. Um, I don't know if anyone wanted to say anything on that now. Um, Danny, I don't know if you had any high level views. But I think we'll take this back. We'll follow up with these parties um, unless anyone wanted to say more on this. Yeah, I think we should talk about this internally. Okay, so for now, we're going to we're going to spin through this um, because that was the only point on this section. Um, and now we're going to get into the kind of the assistance energy transfer product. You know, folks would like to, to receive and supply this product. Um, and so, as we've laid out here, it's a short run product expiring at the end of 2025. Um, election into the product will happen through the master file process for all the entities that can use the master file process. And for those that can't use the master file process, meaning KISO, um, the market notice process was seen as the appropriate corollary, um, similar time frame, similar process. Um, so, uh, we received some comments last night from the CPUC raising concerns with this. And so I didn't know, um, CPC, if you want to say anything more, I think now is the time, um, as we've noted here in our response, we think the B BPM is the appropriate place to delineate the conditions for participation. But as far as the mechanics of, of the master file or the market notice, um, we think this is the appropriate mechanic to use. So, so I'll open the floor if, if anyone from the stakeholder community wants to weigh in on either using the master file process for, for um, EIM entities or KISO using the market notice as the corollary. Um, happy to have a discussion on that. Um, let's see. Okay, I think we don't have any raised hands on, on that unless I've missed something. There are no hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you. So then I think I think our um, our main issue to tackle with folks is is really the LPT export piece. We received a number of comments on this section from, from a number of parties. Um, Danny, I think we should try to actually have a little bit of structured discussion here um, before before we open up the lines. Um, we, we received concerns from BPA about the product um, and their ability to receive the product and, and some of that ties to reserves. So I think, why don't, why don't I hand it over to you, Danny, maybe to provide a little clarification on, on how we saw the reserve issue um, after we spoke with our, our operators. Um, and then um, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to get the language in the tariff right so that it enables all, all who want to use the product to use the product. 
Um, so I think Danny, anything else you want to weigh in on? And then I think we'll walk through the specific comments, but, but why don't you take the reserve and, and BPA's issue 1st? Um, and then that well, why don't we move from there? So, is this the, the 1st comment relating to the EEA 3. No, let's come back to EEA 3. Let's let's take this on the, uh, uh, on the macro level that I think. Um, BPA was concerned that they were going to be unable to accept the product if it's if it's if our tariff specifies that we're tagging GFP, and and so I think we we want to clarify with BPA oh. that that Kaiso will be providing reserves on the product. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for uh, reminding me, Heather. So yeah, the lower priority exports are something Kaiso. Is planning to carry reserves for and does carry reserves for right now. So, to the extent that is the issue with certain entities being able to sync this product, we want to be clear that we do plan to carry reserves for this product. I think that we in the tariff will look to denote that these lower priority exports do have uh, lower priority than ISO demand. And then I think the exact tagging designations, uh, given some of the discussions we've had internally and the comments we received, we would probably look to define exactly how these are tagged through a BPM to not tie our tariff to tagging standards, which, which can change uh, through other venues. Thanks, Danny. And so I, I think I, what we want to communicate is, is that we've heard the concerns here. Um, we think excluding these as, as we've talked about and as the board approved, you know, excluding the LPT exports is, is crucial to this proposal. And so, um, you know, we want to continue discussions on it, but, but BPA, we, we read your comments and, and we're trying to work on a, a, a macro solution there that can hopefully in, enable the product. I think those discussions will need to continue. Um, but I think with that in mind that we're all trying to, to work together. Um, I think then, Danny, why don't we move into the EEA 3 language? I think we have some differing stakeholder viewpoints. Um, you know, Bonneville, I think, is is raising one concern and the CPUC, I think, um, supports the language that we have in here. Can you just walk the stakeholders through our thinking on, on, on this section and the EEA 3 language? Yeah, I think we were trying to give uh, references to when we would envision curtailing these exports <clears throat> sequentially, kind of within the actions our operators would take. Uh, we would try to protect them up to the point where KISO demand was put at risk. Uh, to us, this demand is put at risk typically when we would start to arm load to replace our reserves that are deployed for energy. That occurs at the start of an EEA-3. And, and so I think our proposal is to is to keep the language as is, um, you know, it, especially since, it, you know, the, the California demand and the CPUC ha has weighed in on their support for the current language. However, we would like to hear from stakeholders um, about if there are differing positions or if this is a make it or break it issue for anyone. Um, and the CPUC should also feel free to weigh in on their support of this provision. Um, but I, I want to open the floor to the EEA 3 and, and see if we can um, come to a coalesce around a common position here. We do have one hand raised. Sure, go ahead. I, bet, I, I can't tell who the hand is, I think. Hi. Hi, this is Allie Mesa Bonneville. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to clarify our comment, and I think you've addressed what our comment was. I, we'd noted in the first sentence in a prior draft of the tariff, it had noted, even it had stated even, or maybe it was in the proposal, I believe, actually, uh, even before the Kaiser Balancing Area authorities in an Energy Emergency Alert 3 in reference to EEA 3 there. Um, I see the way that you're talking about it with the reference in the second sentence um, clarifies that the intent is still that they would not be curtailed until th that curtailment is needed to prevent the need to arm load. So I think that clarifies and just addresses our question um, and concern about that change in language. So thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks, Ali. So I think then I think we're on the same page then about the language. If there's anything more, folks can folks can follow up. Um, but but we appreciate that. Um, the the 2nd thing is, I, I think uh, we wanted to raise it with the stakeholders here. This last C, we have always floated language that uses the term protected self schedules. Um, it, it, I, we got a couple comments saying what, what exactly is a protected self schedule? 
I believe it's it's similar to the concept of the fixed self schedules that are discussed up in um, you just 312, um, the main body. Um, I think the question is, um, would it would it be are folks okay if we delete the and that are protected self schedules? Is this language? Oops, sorry, I I got a little crazy with my cursor. Um, you know, is this language extra and can it go? Um, if this language is important to any stakeholders and, and there was meaning, there was an important meaning here, we'd like to surface that now. Um, and it may be rather than deleting, we change this to say, and that are fixed self schedules so that, so that we're just clear that we're linking up with the 312 language. Um, but we want to open it to discussion for, for the best way to handle it. We, we got two and I think maybe even three comments on, on this particular phrase. So I think. First thing I want to do is Danny, um, just to confirm that we'd be okay deleting it or adding clarification if there's stakeholders that that need this language. Um, but I think that we're trying to really uh, just just clarify that you know where we are here and and if uh, Kaiso has any positions on it. Yeah, I, I I'm comfortable at least removing the language. I think the content of A, B, and C really spells out the priority that would be given to curtailments of lower priority exports and, and how that would be sequenced. And so I think then the next question is, is are there any stakeholders that um, view this language as, as, as important or crucial to the proposal, um, see it as necessary to its implementation? If so, we, we want to respect that and, and, and hear so that, so that we can understand that. Um, otherwise, I think our default position is going to be that we're going to remove this language. So I want to open the floor to anyone who sees the need to preserve the language, this, this last language, and that are protected self schedules. We did have a hand raised before you just asked that question. Oh. Uh, should I go ahead with? The, yes, go ahead uh, with the first hand. Oh. I'm sorry, I got to figure out how to see these hands on mm. my next call. Thanks all for no. bearing with me. Go ahead. All right, please go ahead. This is Bonnie Blair. I think, I mean, I think that's who you meant to unmute. <laughs> yep, you're set. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm not super comfortable with removing that language because then I think it makes the scope of, of subpart C a, a lot broader. Um, I, I think I would, I would be okay with, uh, with the idea of fixed self schedule. Um, because I, I I was one of the ones who said what's a protected self schedule, and really was trying to figure out you know what's a protected self schedule versus an unprotected self schedule, um, and so I'm comfortable with fixed self schedules. Um, I think that taking out any reference to self schedules then means that any Stay ahead schedule that clears in HASP, whether it's a self schedule or an economic schedule, um, doesn't, you know, has a higher priority. And I think it's appropriate to have a higher priority for self schedules versus economic schedules, um, unless I'm misunderstanding. No, Bonnie, I'm just going to repeat it back to you to make sure I understood. So I think what I heard you say is the language has value. Um, the term protected may be confusing, and so fixed probably takes care of that. But then in keeping in the clause rather than deleting it, we're putting in a delineation between self schedules and, and economic bids um, and giving a higher priority to those self schedules. So is that, did I get it right? I think so, yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we had a second hand. And then Danny, I think you might want to weigh in, it looks like. There are no more hands raised. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, Bonnie. Danny, uh, over to you. Yeah, no, I, I actually think this was the intent. The, the whole idea is that a day ahead export that clears the rough process, we would be uh, comfortable standing behind counting in the ISO's RSC, and then that, that day ahead export would have priority over any real time only export if it came to needing curtailments. Okay, so unless there's anyone else from the ISO that wants to weigh in, I think our I think the way we're going to propose to address the stakeholder comments on this issue is to keep the language, but nix the protected word, 
and replace it with fixed, as I've indicated with a question mark here, but we'll we'll firm that up in the next draft. Um, if, if anyone else wants to weigh in on this issue, I think now is the time folks can consider it, but I think we've kind of walked through through its impact. Um, you know, I, you know, if folks, you know, feel differently on that impact, you know, you should weigh in either by reaching out or, or letting us know now. Um, but otherwise, this is how we propose to address. So I'll just pause if anyone wants to raise their hand. Now is the time and the event producer will let me know that there are hands raised. Yes, there are no hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, and then now to, I think, the, the, the biggest macro issue on the table, which is the tagging. We previewed our proposed approach um, that we will move the tagging language into the BPMs um, and also in the BPMs add clarity that Kaiso will be providing reserves on the product. Um, I don't know if there is more to say here other than what was already said in comments um, and in our preview, but I do want to open the floor now because, you know, we, we want to hear from, oh, the parties. I just realized one thing. Um, I think uh, Pacific, Pacific Core, you weighed in with some delineations on different types of, of GFP, and I apologize for, for not putting that specifically in here. Um, Danny, did you want to weigh in on, on Pacific Core, on the GFP 1, 2, and 3 proposal, um, and maybe why, why that's not necessary? But in any case, I think we propose that all of this would be moved to the BPM. Yeah, I think that's right, Heather. This would be in the BPM, and then we view these as all GFPs, and then the priorities would be fixed based off which market they clear in, what's the uh, most advanced market uh, having the highest priority. So we don't want to overcomplicate this, and GFP is going to be a big enough change in general, so we don't see the need to uh, spell out different permeations of GFP. I think. There's been discussion in the implementation sphere of maybe putting different priorities in the miscellaneous field, denoting which market they cleared in for lower priority exports. And I think that's the direction we would lean in right now uh, for that additional specificity. And, and so, Mr. Forrest, I didn't want you to think your issue had gone unaddressed. And, and so I think just bringing us back, we'll, we'll propose to put the tagging in, in the BPMs, not, not here in the tariff. Um, but where we have settled is that GFP is, is we think the right tag for, for this product and what, what we plan to flow through the BPMs with clarity in the BPMs that Kaiso will be providing reserves on that product. Um, and by, we, we think the miscellaneous field can be used by a number of parties for, for any sort of designations or, or clarity. Uh, on further investigation, we have learned that different, um, different providers in the West, you're using different software uh, permutations. And so the use of the miscellaneous field or specific tagging issues varies amongst parties. Uh, there does not seem to be a uniformity here. So I wanna open up the floor to discussion to all the stakeholders um, about our proposal to move tagging to the BPMs. And if anyone has more to say on, on the GFP tag, I think we're, we're happy to hear um, and, and try to move forward. Um, other than, you know, we, we've read your comments. And so if there's anything incremental, you know, now is that we'd love to hear it now. All right, there is a caller in the queue. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Allie again from Bonneville. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to clarify one thing. Sorry, I couldn't get myself uh, off mute and hand raised before I say this <laughs> no, on the GFP. No um, but on the topic of the tagging, and just wanted to clarify one element of the, the issue for Bonneville, um, th that we understand that Kaiso would be carrying reserves for, that does carry reserves for these products and will carry reserves for them in the future. I think our concern is um, because of the size of our BA and the number of LSEs within it, if we allow, uh, currently we only allow um, firm energy to be imported. And if we open that to firm provisional, it's not just Kaiso. Um, that would that we'd be opening it up to, but potentially imports from other um, entities that may or may not carry reserves in the same way for them. So I just wanted to clarify. We really appreciate the attention you're giving to this, um, but just wanted to clarify that area of of concern for us. 
Thanks, Ali. And I, I think we, we hear you there. Um, I think, you know, a number of stakeholders are on the call who, who do participate across the broader West. And so, so we note the issue for, for all. Um, but otherwise, I think unless there are any other hands raised, we are at the end of our tariff uh, proposals here. Of course, we have, we have the definition. We appreciate that everyone's on board with the definition and, and we receive no comments on that. Um, and so I think that wraps up our review. Um, I, Danny, I'll turn it over for you and for how you want to wrap up the call. Uh, I didn't have anything else to add. So, so thank you for running us through this, Heather. And we look forward to getting additional feedback on this. Yeah, so Bonnie, we'll be following up with you. Um, I, if there were others, Isabella's probably gonna let me know, but I, I did actually, I did remember that one. Um, and so if anyone else would like to have us follow up on any of these specific issues, we're, we're happy to do so. We, we are here to discuss, um, provide the details um, as needed. So don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I think we, until we talk to you guys next time, um, and last call for KISO staff, anything else for the good of the order? Okay, then Isabella, I think we're done for the day. All right, that concludes today's stakeholder call. Thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.